the people of New Jersey, you know, listen, this is a, this is a really, really difficult blow to the state, but not one that we won't recover from. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Schneider. Thank you for joining us. This has been a very difficult day here in New Jersey. Hurricane Sandy came and went and left behind a trail of destruction that's almost impossible to describe. Take a look at some of the video we have in this evening. Uh, this first video coming to us, uh, basically, this is what's happened down in Atlantic City. The place was swamped. The boardwalk took a serious beating. Most of it down in that section is gone. Uh, we have a video taken from a New Jersey National Guard helicopter. Devastation that d delivered directly to Seaside Heights. Homes and cars destroyed. And look at this landscape, totally transformed. Everywhere you look up and down the shore, as dawn came, it was clear. Damage and destruction. And throughout the state as a whole, trees and power lines down virtually everywhere you look, plunging millions of people into darkness tonight. And then those floodwaters. Well, they kept rising for a long time today. The power companies are telling New Jersey it could be a week or perhaps even more before everybody gets its power back. We'll be talking with the CEO of PSEG a little bit later in the broadcast. Gas lines, you may have, if you drove around today, and of course you were urged not to, but if you had to and you're out there, this is a scene that you might have been lucky enough to come across if you could find a service station that in fact was open. Motorists looking for a place, any place, to gas up their cars, to fill up those tanks, and to try to find some place with pumps that were being operated so that they could move around and perhaps get to work or just get back home and perhaps power up some of the portable generators that many of our fellow New Jerseyans have. To the inland, some people had to be rescued from high water. It was horrible scenes of misery on a scale that was pretty much almost impossible to imagine beforehand in this state, in our state. But we are not alone in our suffering tonight. Our neighbors to the north and to the south and to the west, they took a beating too. But tomorrow, we're going to see a repeat of a meeting between Governor Christie and President Obama. You might recall last year they toured all the storm damage in Patterson. Tomorrow they'll survey a far worse and far broader scene. Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, telling us now how these two political adversaries are coming together and trying to help millions of suffering people. Five network morning talk shows this morning, then around 10 a.m., delivered this chilling assessment of what the state endured last night. I know that many people in our state woke up today to absolute devastation. Uh, there are no words to describe what so many New Jerseyans experienced over the last 24 hours and what they will have to contend with over the coming days, weeks, and months. I'll first say to all of you, uh, especially those out there who are facing loss, devastation, and the heartbreaking reality that your home may be gone, we are with you. We have a long road ahead of us, but I have complete confidence we're going to come out of this better and stronger than before. This state is too tough to give in to this type of devastation, and uh, we in the government will be here to work with you uh, to have New Jersey completely recover. He spoke of power outages, major flooding, uprooted homes, search and rescue operations, 178 highway closures, and a troubled rail system. Later today, New Jersey Transit will begin assessing the status of the system and testing critical infrastructure before any decisions are made regarding the potential resumption of service. We do know this. There is major damage on each and every one of New Jersey's rail lines. Large sections of track were washed out on the New Jersey coastline. Numerous power lines and trees have fallen along New Jersey Transit railways across the state. A downed tree right outside the state police complex where the governor spoke symbolized all he was speaking of. At the end of a half-hour briefing, someone asked what effect a week's-long cleanup might have on next week's election. I will tell you, this administration at the moment could give a damn less about Election Day. If you hear the things that I just talked about, um, and the devastation that's been visited upon this state, I am sure that while the national election is obviously very important, that the people of New Jersey at this moment would really be unhappy with me if they thought for a second I was occupying my time thinking about how I was going to get people to vote a week from today. So I don't give a damn about Election Day. 
It doesn't matter a lick to me. Around 1230, the governor and a traveling party took off in four state police helicopters to tour the battered shoreline. For NJ Today, I'm Michael Aaron in West Trenton. All right, so obviously one of the major concerns this evening are the people who are in throughout our state, so many of them who have no power uh, and no ability to, uh, to do the things at home that we all take for granted. You probably know somebody in that situation right now if you're watching, and you might be, uh, through the luck of having a, a generator, be one of them yourself. At any rate, joining us right now, Ralph Izzo, the chairman and CEO of PSEG. Ralph, just a week ago or so, we were talking about this storm coming in. You had said that it was going to be a big one and a bad one. It turned obviously out to be that. Was it more than you expected? Well, it was, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me on. When we talked, we knew about the hurricane winds. And we knew that the possible path would take it to New Jersey. Uh, what we didn't realize was that we would literally see upwards of 10 to 14 feet of storm surge uh, going into the lower New York Bay and the Newark Bay and the Raritan Bay areas. So while the wind was quite damaging and probably resulted in about six or 700,000 customers out, the, uh, the, the flooding that came from those storm surges produced another half million making this by far the worst storm in our company's history. Out there? Are crews already on the job? They are. They are. Uh, because of the damage created by the flooding, however, uh, what we're needing to, to have done first is to make sure what we call our substations, these are the fenced-in areas that have uh, transformers and large equipment, are all capable of delivering power to the circuits and wires that people uh, see in every street. So the the type of normal visibility you will see from us after a storm where the truck is on the block and a fixed fire is not going to be as for the early days because we're going to be inside our own facilities fixing our own uh, plant so that we can uh, feed those wires. Uh, Ralph, is there a timetable? Because you know the big question in people's minds is how fast, uh, how quickly can I get my power restored? Uh, I know we've heard estimates of seven to ten days. Is that is that somewhere in the ballpark? That that is correct. You know, you, 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 for instance, though, Mike, we we restored the city of Newark today, uh, so so some things can happen sooner. But we have not even fully assessed the damage as yet for, for two simple reasons: uh, we weren't able to put people. Uh, out in the field, uh, given the weather conditions we had in full this morning, and we're just having some challenges getting from point A to point B. We're getting all sorts of cooperation from the governor and state government. Uh, everyone is doing all they can to help us. We couldn't be more appreciative of that, but it is going to be a painstakingly slow assessment and restoration process, despite the fact that we brought in 1,500 people from places as far away as Quebec and Texas prior to the storm, and they're still bringing people in as we speak now. Where, Ralph, was it the worst, I mean, in terms of, of the counties or, or particular towns? Did you have any particular damage uh, that, that surprised you? Uh, no, no, no damage surprised us once we saw that wall of water come in. So I'd say that the damage is spread throughout the state, except there is a concentration in uh, Hudson and Essex counties. There, the, this, this type of concentrated damage that I refer to in our substations literally wiped out entire towns. The entire city of Newark went dark uh, last night while we were in our headquarters at about, uh, I guess it was 9 or 10 p.m., and uh, we lost the city of Elizabeth. We've lost uh, a good portion of Jersey City. So our focus has been getting the urban areas back because with uh, with concentrated effort, we can restore the greatest number of customers by doing that. And then, of course, the, the hospitals, the, the schools, and the, uh, the, the, the target customers uh, that serve the public benefit are, are also high on that list. All right. Just to, to re uh, repeat, what, uh, in case viewers miss this, we're talking about right now somewhere restoration of power to all within seven to ten days. I know it's tough to, to make that estimation considering what we've seen, but that's a fair assessment? Yeah, yes, that, that is what we've been telling people. We will continue to update everyone. However, uh, I think we've been doing it twice a day. And uh, as we get the assessment more and more refined, we can be a little bit more uh, precise about different parts of the state and the timing for that. Well, we're going to wish you a lot of luck because we're all counting on you. Uh, Ralph Izzo, thank you very much. We'll talk again. Thank you, Mike. Take uh, care.
Uh, Ralph is the chairman and CEO of PSEG. We, we had Ralph on the program just about a week ago, and we did have a conversation specifically about this, the formation of this uh, storm. And uh, he was very, very sober in his assessment of what was coming back then. And uh, we got what, uh, what they had feared and what we had all feared, apparently. Uh, now on to a, a, a scene that was kind of a, remarkable. Uh, nobody expected this one at all. A levee breaking and flooding out Little Ferry and Munaki and Karlstad. And the Hudson then overflowing into Hoboken. It has been an incredible scene to survey. Our Andrew Schmertz with the story now. In Little Ferry and Monaki, more than a thousand people, along with their dogs and cats, had to be carried and ferried to dry land, and then many taken to local shelters. The water level easily reached the first floor of many homes after a tidal surge from the Hackensack River swamped barriers designed to keep low level areas dry. First responders, including the National Guard, came from all over the state. Even a National Guard truck ran into trouble. Those rescued say it was one of the most terrifying nights and then mornings of their life. The rain was crazy, but 7 in the morning, the fire department pounded on our doors, got us all out. Then they took us by bus or by boat over here to Dunkin' Donuts because it was too high to walk in, and now they're escorting us out through uh, these trucks right here. So they're doing an amazing job. How high was the water? Oh, man, my car's done. The water is about up to the handles. Well, last night I went back to sleep um, looking out and I, everything was flooded. Um, so this morning when we took a look outside again and our basement is completely flooded, um, I was trying to reassure the kids that we would be okay and we saw everyone getting rescued. We're doing the best we can as long as the kids are all safe. We have a lot of babies all together. We're three families. We all live on the same block, me and my sister and my mother and father. And we lost everything. The water started coming up to our main floors of our house. Uh, as you have probably gleaned by now over the past 24, 36 hours of our coverage, uh, our reporters have been working monstrous hours trying to cover this storm for you in as many places as possible uh, and uh, as long as possible. Andrew now is standing by live. Andrew Schmertz in Jersey City for us. Uh, Andrew, how do things stand right now? Well, you know, Mike, the uh, the power is still largely out here in Hoboken. The water seems to be receding a little bit, but a lot of people are very frustrated. And because of spotty cell phone service, somewhat desperate, we met a woman just about a couple hours ago who drove a couple hours from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, to pick up her daughter here in Hoboken, and she can't get in because a large part of the city is, is cut off right now from the outside world. So it is going to be a very difficult uh, few days here. Those taken to shelters that we met earlier in Little Ferry, they don't know when they're going to be able to get back to their homes. A lot of unanswered questions. How much damage are we talking about to the infrastructure? You're, you're in Hoboken, not Jersey City, Andrew. Is that correct? We're on the border of uh, Jersey City and Hoboken. There's a sign right over my shoulder, actually, that says, Welcome to Hoboken. So we're right on the border. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of damage to infrastructure, and they're still got to tally, um, you know, tally up all of, the, uh, all of the costs there. You know, there's a lot of uh, gas leaks that have been reported. Those have to be fixed. A lot of uh, first responders out. There's going to be a tremendous amount of overtime. And all the bridges are going to have to be, obviously, be looked at carefully to see what kind of damage was done uh, in this storm. But, you know, there's a tremendous amount of power that's out, and that really has to be uh, addressed first for many people. We saw these people moving around and being taken out. I, I presume uh, some of them, you know, end up in, in where are they going? I'm not going to presume anything. Where are these people going? You know, a lot of people didn't know, you know, if they could go to friends and family, they would do that. But, you know, uh, driving around the state, certainly here in the northern part of the state, is very, very difficult. So if they're on their own trying to get to relatives, they're having difficulty doing that. Others are taken uh, to shelters and uh, may be at those shelters for some time. And so they're wondering how much support is going to be at the shelters. Are they going to be able to get medication? Are they going to be able to communicate with, uh, with family members? A lot of these people just wanted to get out of their homes. They woke this morning, and the water was lapping at the front door. It was, you know, a lot of these homes uh, in Little Ferry uh, have basements, uh, finished basements. So that's one portion that was flooded. And then the water started rising to the first floor. They had to get out. You know, it's interesting, too, because we heard the governor very aggressively criticize people who stayed behind on the barrier islands, who defied him and, and ignored his warnings to get out when he said it was time to get out and, and potentially put uh, the uh, lives of some of the first responders at risk. But these people in these areas had no reason to believe, in most cases, that anything like this was coming their way. Uh, they, uh, the level of what surprise we, must you know, be overwhelming. Over and over again for people is... 
overwhelming. What we heard from people over and over again is, I've never seen anything like this. I've lived here for 40 years. We never expected this. So then when the water comes out of nowhere and floods their streets, they were very surprised. And that's why I think a lot of them were very much caught off guard and that they, you know, people needed to literally be rescued. When you, when you see, it's an amazing sight, Mike, when you see people in the back of National Guard trucks that you see elsewhere in other parts of the world being carried off. That was a really stunning sight to see today. Absolutely. Andrew Schmertz covering the story for us on the border there of Hoboken and Jersey City. Andrew, thank you very much. And he raises a very interesting point. You know, we, uh, we reporters in many cases have covered uh, storms, big storms, in fact. Uh, but it's, it's one thing to go on a plane to a place where something bad is about to happen and cover that story. It is something else entirely when you go around the corner and the storm has come to you. So it's, uh, it's very deeply personally felt by all of the folks we have out there in the field and by all the staff we have here behind the scenes as well. Uh, we're going to take a break right now. Uh, many viewers need some information when it comes to who to contact about serious situations. We're going to put it up on the screen right now and let it linger long enough so that if you have a pen and paper and a light available to, with which to write or you want to put it into your, one of your smartphones or an iPad perhaps, uh, take in this information and uh, we'll be back in a second. Once again, uh, we'll be putting up information on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, if you have access to the website, of course, you can find a lot of the links there uh, for that matter, too. Uh, talking about the destruction, we, we alluded to this earlier about the Atlantic City boardwalk uh, taking such a battering. Uh, the boardwalk in Spring Lake, very famous boardwalk, it's gone. It's gone. Lots of damage all up and down the Jersey shoreline. Our Desiree Taylor is in Point Pleasant for us right now. Des, uh, I've seen some scenes of what the boardwalk there used to look like. I used to take my kids there. Uh, tell me about what it's like now. I'm standing near a marina in Point Pleasant that is located close to the train tracks here. And I don't know if you can see it just behind me, but I can certainly tell you that several boats have actually washed up onto the tracks. It's quite an amazing sight to see, and it's just one example of just how powerful the height of this storm was last night. I can also tell you there's significant flooding here, and that seems to be the case for towns up and down the Jersey Shore. But some communities were hit especially hard. In Spring Lake, the boardwalk was ripped in pieces, just completely destroyed. In fact, we found big chunks of it blocks away from the beach on residential streets. And that boardwalk was recently replaced after Tropical Storm Irene last year. Also in Spring Lake, huge sand dunes that once blocked the view here were completely blown away. Other shore towns have seen similar destruction. The boardwalk in Seagirt was also severely damaged, and there are trees there that were completely uprooted, as well as in other towns across the state. We also saw downed wires in Manasquan and flooded streets in that town as well. But the story in Seaside Heights was especially compelling because late this afternoon, crews were still trying to rescue people who stayed behind and tried to ride it out there during the storm. I can also tell you there was significant, uh, significant uh, uh, destruction at Casino Pier, and the roller coaster there was completely destroyed in Seaside Park. Now, much of the day, there have been helicopters patrolling this area, state police, the National Guard. Uh, they've been hovering above, uh, patrolling this, and, uh, this area and up and down the Jersey Shore. Now, here in Point Pleasant, there are still uh, authorities on the scene. We've seen fire. We've seen military vehicles, rescue vehicles. Uh, most of them are trying to control the traffic and uh, keep motors away from flooded streets. So uh, as you've been hearing uh, throughout the day and, and uh, on this newscast tonight, the destruction is widespread, and it seems recovery will take some time. That's the story here in Point Pleasant. I'm Desiree Taylor, 
Now back to you, Mike. All right, Desiree, thank you very much. Uh, farther down the uh, shore in Cape May, our Lauren Wonko has been sending back uh, some very, very uh, informative reports, to say the least, and in some cases uh, overwhelming in terms of the imagery that we're getting out from them because uh, she, last night, you might recall, was sitting there with the winds uh, virtually knocking her over, blasting, blasting her inside a building and then almost uh, sending her tumbling while she was standing inside a doorway. But today came back an image which... I guess is probably going to personify what it was like to be on the shore the day after the storm did such enormous damage uh, because the beach suddenly has moved inland. Take a look at her report. Sand accumulated overnight here in Cape May, anywhere from one to five feet. And check out this street sign behind me. We are on Beach Avenue. We are on the street right now. But as you can see, the street has turned into a beach. Now, Tim, if you can widen out a little bit, You'll see that there are equipment operators behind me here who are doing everything they can right now to move that sand back where it belongs. I spoke to the mayor of Cape May earlier. He told me he's very happy to report no fatalities and no injuries. He said really city officials are quite relieved, especially given the horrific situation that other towns are in right now. He had said over 90% of this town has power. Now, I can't stress enough. It is still very dangerous to be on this beach right now. It's not raining, but the wind gusts are incredibly strong, and it's picking up this sand and turning it into a bit of a sandstorm, which is making it really painful. This is becoming a bit of a tourist attraction, but it's best to stay off the beach right now. For now, back to you in the studio. When I told you, it was uh, a rather, when we saw Lauren filing that report, we were stunned by the imagery that you just saw, but that's exactly what this hurricane has done to this state. I'm going to take a break back in a moment. Some more emergency contact information coming up on your screen right now. Obviously, one of the first things to be impacted by the approach of the storm was mass transit in the state of New Jersey. And joining us now is the uh, NJ Transit spokesman, John Durso. Uh, John, uh, it's good of you to join us. Where do things stand right now in, in uh, NJ Transit's uh, plan to get back into business? Sure, Mike, and good, after, uh, good evening to you and to all of your listeners. We hope everyone is safe and sound at home and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to you and your viewers this evening. Customers should not expect the, sur uh, the system to resume service immediately. It's undeniably, it will take some time to fully assess the impact on our system. Mike, if I may, you know, I would note that you know, what we saw yesterday, um, it was more than devastation. It was destruction. And I think that really uh, summarizes the impact to New Jersey transit system, our rails, our rail yards, and our critical operation centers. You know, we've seen destruction uh, to our system throughout the state, whether it was on the Atlantic City line, whether it was on the Maine and Bergen line. I know that you've had some reports. I know you've seen we've had washouts along the North Jersey coastline, even have a bridge that has boats on it. Um, this has been a storm of ep epic proportions. Uh, as you know, New Jersey Transit was involved in some uh, extensive preparations for this storm. Uh, but at the end, uh, what we saw was hurricane force winds uh, throughout the state of New Jersey, in Newark as well as in southern Jersey, and we've seen the result of that. Uh, John, in, in terms of the bus lines, uh, were they spared some of the damage that the rail lines incurred? What we can say, uh, you know, the assessment right now of all of our facilities and all of our equipment, including buses, are still ongoing. Thus far, as part of our review process, we have not found extensive damage to our buses as well as to our bus garages. We have approximately 15 bus garages throughout the state. No major damage has been found thus far. We did move certain, uh, some buses out of flood-prone areas uh, just as a precautionary measure. That proved successful. No issues resulted from that. But again, bus service is part of, you know, New Jersey Transit will 
eventually be able to restore service, but we're going to do it when it will be safe, not only for our customers, but for our employees. John, only a few the, seconds here. Could you tell sure. me, do you expect that to be within a matter of days, or are we talking about weeks or more? Well, until further notice, Mike, and that may span a number of days. And what we would encourage all of your listeners to do is to log on to njtransit.com to follow broadcasts such as yours and to keep appraised. We, we pledge to continue to communicate directly with our customers, and we thank you for your time tonight. Well, listen, we, we thank you for coming on, and once again, uh, newscasters rarely do this, but we, we are wishing you good luck as well because there are so many people in this state who count on NJ Transit to be able to uh, get to work and get around their homes. John, thank you very much. We will talk again. Uh, so that brings us to the conclusion of this broadcast. We're coming back on the air for you at 7.30. But, uh, actually, the governor has another news conference coming up, so we'll join you as soon as that gets underway. But once again, uh, you know, just be aware that we continue to monitor the story as best we can. If you have any interesting videos or pictures to, uh, to send us, you know where you can send them to us on our Twitter using hashtag NJSandy or uh, to our uh, news team. We'll be alert to them. Facebook, you can send it to our Facebook.com slash NJTV on site, the online site as well. Till then, I'm Mike Schneider. I'll see you back here in a couple of moments. New Jersey's facing tough times, but teachers are problem solvers. So we work hard to help our students succeed. When my students score well on the AP exam, I know that I've made a difference.